I did I did turn 50 and I did um, uh, I did the Israel Trail, go from the north to the south of Israel, and I invited people to join me. Some people I knew, some people I didn't know. And um, every morning we started with the three rules of the trail: uh, no phones from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Very good rule. Uh, whatever is said on the trail stays on the trail. Uh, and then the last rule was that everybody had to introduce themselves with an embarrassing story. Uh, the person that was on the stage a few moments ago had lots of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but because of the second rule, I can't repeat Moran's uh, stories. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one of mine just as a starting point, and then I'll recommend that you use this approach as you meet people uh, throughout the next few days. Um, so, um, actually, before I, I'll say this, I'll, uh, as you probably noticed, I have half a beard. Uh, there, are two, there are two reasons for this half a beard. Uh, the first one is I stopped shaving. That's, that's, the, that's the reason for this side. Uh, the second reason is that I was, I was badly burned many years ago, uh, about 70% of my body. I was in hospital for many years. Uh, so I have lots of scars. Scars don't have hair, so the right side of my face um, it has scars. So I'm not trying to do a half and half uh, kind of approach. It just This is how the, the pattern of burns uh, just happened to be. Okay, so one embarrassing story. So maybe two years um, after my initial uh, injury, uh, one of my friends in hospital uh, tells me that maybe it's time to go on a date. I said, yeah, are you interested? She asked me if I'm interested. I said, yes, I'm interested. And she said she'll explore and figure out if among her friends somebody would be willing to date me. So she goes ahead. She, <laughs> she looks, she explores. She doesn't tell me what percentage of people said yes, but she comes back and said no. But she comes back and she said, I think I have a candidate. How about meeting and going for ice cream? I said, great. So she takes me. I couldn't drive at the time. She takes me and we go to the beach and meet this other uh, very nice woman, uh, order ice cream, uh, sit uh, facing the beach. It's a little bit uh, after sunset. And we, we start talking. Maybe two or three meeting, maybe two or three minutes into the, into the discussion, she asked me something about hospital. I, I don't remember what exactly she asked, but I go into a tirade about a nurse I hated. This, this was a person that was cruel and vicious. I think he enjoys hurting uh, the patients. And I, I would try to reorganize my day as, as a way to avoid him. I would try to figure out when he's on duty and try to get treatment in different hours. If he was on duty on the weekend, I would try to get operate on Friday so that nobody would treat me. I, I really hated the guy. I really hated the guy. I was afraid of him. I hated him. And I didn't talk about him with anybody. And, and this poor woman just asked me a question, and I just go into it. And I don't know, maybe 15 minutes, and I just describe hate and hate and anger. And, and, and I go and I go and I go. And at the end of the 15 minutes, I just breathe heavily. I, I unloaded. You know, I feel, I feel good. Like, you know, all these, all these things. I just breathe heavily. And kind of, I'm, 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 I feel better. And she says, uh, and what's his name? And I say, I say his name. And she stands up and she says, it's my father. <laughs> I've never seen her since. <laughs> I have more stories, but I want to talk a little bit about social science. <laughs> and what I would like to propose today is that the lens of social science is a great way not only to understand what goes around life, but how to design things in a better way. Right? So, so let's, let's think about a couple of uh, examples for this. So let's think about saving for a rainy day. Let's say it's a good thing to get people to save for a rainy day. How would we go about it? How do we go about it? The standard answer for this is tell people. Tell people that it's really good to save, and they'll run around and start saving. By the way, how effective is it to tell people that what's the right thing to, to do? Not very. Uh, just a, a couple of uh, examples. Uh, how many of you in the last month have eaten more than you think you should? Just kind of a general <laughs> statement. Uh, how many of you in the last month have exercised less than you think you should? Okay. 
How many of you, this has been the most amount of exercise? <laughs> <laughs> um, how many of you in the last month have texted and driving? Texted while driving, please be honest. Okay, some of you probably just don't drive. You, you feel smug, but you just don't, <laughs> don't drive. Couple of more. Uh, how many of you in the last month have not always washed your hands when you left the bathroom? <laughs> it's interesting, right? We're willing to admit we text and drive, not washing our hands. That's, uh, <laughs> that's embarrassing. Last question. Uh, how many of you have ever had unplanned, unprotected sex? We're going to show our documentary on dishonesty uh, tomorrow night. <laughs> I recommend that you show. OK. So, so the reality is that we, when we think about it, we often think that the right approach to get people to behave differently is to give them some information, and then they'll do it, even though the experience we have day to day suggests that this is not the case. But uh, these are the results from a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis to take all the research ever to be done in a particular domain and say, what do we learn from this? And this particular research looks at all the research, all the things that we've done on what's called financial literacy, all the things that we do to teach people about how to deal with money. And the question is, do people learn something? And the answer is yes. Do they remember some of it? The answer is yes. But do they change their behavior? The answer is no. Um, there is a small increase in saving, planning, debt, cash flow, and so on, but the effect is very small. By the way, in total, in the US, we spend between seven and $800 million a year teaching people about how to deal with their money better, and the effects are very small. Now, this might seem small, but it's actually the picture is worse, because while the effect is small in the beginning, it goes down over time, and it's even lower for people for lower social economic status. And in total, they estimate that for seven to eight hundred million dollars a year, we get 0.1 percent improvement in financial outcome. Not zero, but really, really close <laughs> to zero. So usually when we think about behavioral change, we think about just teaching people. That doesn't work. What does social science tell us about how to change behavior? So let me tell you about something that we have done. Um, in this piece of research, uh, we, we did this in Kibera. Kibera is a slum in Kenya. And we were trying to get very poor people to save a little bit of money. Uh, just to realize what very poor mean, these are people who live on about $10 a week. These are people who work in the informal sector. And why do we want them to save? This is not because we want them to save for retirement. Retirement is not a question for these individuals. But what happened is that if you live hand to mouth, and, and something happens, something bad, things can deteriorate very quickly. This is true for the poor around the world, but just imagine the following. Imagine that you're um, a poor individual, you live in Kibera, you have a goat, and your goat gives you 25% of your income. And one day, something bad happens, and bad things happen all the time. For example, your goat gets sick. All of a sudden, you live hand to mouth, you have no access, you have to keep on living. What do you do? You borrow. If, if you borrow in Kibera, you might be borrowing at 10% a week. And let's say that four weeks later, something good happens, your goat is healthy again. You're now four weeks behind plus interest rate. How do you get out of this? Maybe if you have a lanternier, you have to sell it. Maybe if you have some tools, you have to, to sell them. And this, by the way, happens all the time. Bad things happen, and then things just escalate downward. So we wanted people to have a little bit of money for a rainy day. Now, what do you think would happen if we said to people, look, keep your regular wallet in your right pocket and keep a special saving wallet in your left pocket? What would happen? People would find things to spend the money on. Even if you walk down in Kibera, you have fruit, more water, more kerosene, there are things to buy. So we said the principle of design we want to have is that it will be easy to save, but hard to get the money back. So we teamed up with M-Pesa. M-Pesa is the payment company in Kenya. Kenya is a country where very few people have bank accounts. Lots of people have an M-Pesa account. It works on any feature phone. It's really an amazing system. So we teamed up with M-Pesa, which means that people could text their money in into their account. And we teamed up with an investment bank, which meant that every night the money moved from M-Pesa to the investment bank. And this system meant it was easy to text money in, 
But if you wanted to get the money out, you couldn't get it out of M-Pesa. You had to take a bus, go to the city, fill a form, wait an hour, take a bus back, it could take you four or five hours. And we wanted this on purpose. We wanted people to have access to their money in case something bad happens, but we didn't want everything to become an emergency. Okay, so we created that system. Imagine we give it to lots and lots of people, and then we do an experiment. We add more things, different conditions. So some people just get what's called the control condition, just this system. Some people get that system plus a weekly reminder that says, try and save 100 shillings this week, about a dollar. Some people get the same text message, but with a message from their kids. It says, hi mom, hi dad, this is little Joey, whatever the name of the kid was, try and save 100 shillings this week for our family. By the way, these people know that their kids don't have a cell phone, it's not a mystery, but it was to remind them, it was to remind them about their family. Another group got a 10% match, save up to 100 shillings, we have 10%. Another group got a 20% match, save up to 100 shillings, we'll give you 20% match. Two other groups also got 10% and 20%, but they got it with what we call pre-match. What is pre-match? There's a principle in behavioral economics called loss aversion. Loss aversion is the idea that we hate losing more than we enjoy gaining. Right? So think about the regular structure. You're in the 10% 10, 10 condition, you put 40 shillings, we add four at the end of the week. In the pre-match, we give you the whole match in the beginning of the week, 10 shillings, let's say. And then you put 40, we leave four in, and we take six back. The idea would be that people would see all the amount of money they don't match every week, and that pain might get them to save more. And finally, we had a condition with a coin. We had a coin about this size, with 24 numbers written on it. We asked people to put the coin somewhere in their hut, and every week we said, this is week one, take a knife and scratch the coin this way if you saved, and this way if you didn't save. People went on like this. Now think about it. Which one of those methods do you think created the highest amount of savings? Text, text from kids, 10% at the end of the week, 20% at the end of the week, 10% beginning of the week, 20% beginning of the week, or the coin? Well, we could take a vote. Um, oh, this is the, the system. We had financial incentives, 10% or 20%, loss aversion. We had something emotional trigger. And we had uh, the coins. Here is how it, the coins look like. OK, so here is what people think. This is not a result. This is what people think. And this is true for both people in Kenya and people in the US, just what people think. Basically, people think that the the 20% would be the most important part, 10% less, and then kids a little bit helpful, coin not that much, and uh, if you don't give people reminders, nothing would, would happen. Okay, what actually happened? Here is what happened. When we gave people no reminders, we just gave people the system, people started saving. That's really good news, right? It means that sometimes we want a system that would make it difficult for us to fail to be tempted, right? Sometimes we want a system that would not let us be tempted. Adding 10% uh, at the end of the week helped some more. Adding at the end of the week 20%, slightly more. In the beginning of the week, with loss aversion, helped a bit more. The kids were the same as 10 and 20% plus loss aversion. If you look at this, it's amazing, right? It means that the value of kids, if any of you don't have kids, if you think about it, the value of kids is basically the same as 20% plus loss aversion in terms of a motivational power. <laughs> and and I, I don't think we, we use kids. I'm not mean, you know, child labor. I don't, think, <laughs> I don't think we think about the motivational force of kids uh, sufficiently. But the, the big surprise was the coin. The big surprise was the coin because the coin basically doubled savings compared to everything else. And, and of course, now that we know that, the question is why. Why was the coin so successful? My, my research center at, at Duke, uh, our name, we, we call ourselves the Center for Advanced Hindsight. <laughs> it's a little hard to, to raise money with this name, but. 
but, but the benefit is that it's designed to remind us that we don't always predict our own, our own results. But why did, we, why did we come up with this coin? Why, what was the motivation for this? And I want to show you one more piece of data, which is that the benefit of the coin, which is what you see here in yellow, was not so much on the day when people got texts. It was all over the week, right? which means that it was a very different reminder. Now, let me tell you how I started thinking about this this coin. So I was in Soweto, a different slum in South Africa. And you know, if I need to design an experiment about buying coffee, I don't need to go anywhere. But when you do experiments in the third world, you, you have to walk around. You have to try and see what's going on. You have to try and understand the system. And I walk around in Soweto, and I see a father buying funeral insurance for a week. Right? In, in South Africa, funerals are very, very expensive. People spend up to two years of income on funerals. And this father bought funeral insurance for a week. And just to be clear, what it means is that it would only apply if he dies in the next seven days, right? And people who have very small amounts of money buy small amount of soap and small amounts of insurance and so on. And he took that certificate and in a very ceremonious way gave it to his son. And when he did this little ceremony of giving it to his son, I thought, you know, without this little ceremony, what would be the most visible thing for the family on the day that somebody buys insurance or saves money? The most visible thing would be that there's going to be less. If you're a breadwinner and one day you put money in insurance or you put money in savings, what you're going to get to the family is less. If you're very poor, it will be tonight. There'll be less fruit, less water, less something. If you're not as poor, it will be maybe not tonight, but it will be something less. And what his father did, I think, in a very intuitive way, is to say it's not less, it's just different. And our coin was designed uh, to have this, uh, this idea in mind. This is a funeral in, in South Africa, very, very festive. <laughs> um, um, so, so I thought, you know, maybe, maybe what we need to do is we need to get the family to understand that there's not less, it's different, and the breadwinner needs to have some pride, right? Otherwise, if you're putting money away and the family is not recognizing it, uh, you're getting less pride of it. So, so that's the first thing. But then um, I started thinking, how did we used to save 300 years ago, 1,000 years ago? How did, how did we save? We saved in goats or in bricks, right? We, we saved in things that were visible, right? And, and when we saved in goats, you could come home at night and you could see how many goats your neighbor has and you could compete who has more goats. But then we invented money. And then we invented digital money. And all of a sudden, we took this whole activity of saving and buying insurance and made it invisible. And we would compete on anything as long as we could see it. But we took these activities of fi finance, saving, long-term, thinking about long-term financial well-being, and we made it invisible. And as a consequence, we can't compete on that. What are we competing on? Spending. Spending is easily measurable. You can easily see what your neighbors have. Saving, you can't. Obviously, we basically overemphasize spending and underemphasize saving. There was a study that showed that when people win the lottery, their neighbors start spending more money. <laughs> and some of them spend so much that they go bankrupt. And I know what you think. You're saying, oh, these crazy Americans. No, Canadians. These were Canadians. <laughs> Good people. Um, <laughs> so imagine we started with this notion of how do we design the world. Imagine that we started by saying, we have money. How would we want to design it? If we're a social scientist and we think about how do we design money, would we want to design it in a way that would make it invisible, that would take some of the most important activities we can take, like saving and buying insurance and make them invisible, and taking some of the activities like buying new cars and make them visible, I don't think so. So we, we can think about how we want to redesign money to get us the outcomes that we, that we want. I want to give you another example, losing weight. Um, we all know the problems of, uh, of weight, weight gain in society. Um, and we started, by think, started thinking about how, how would we approach this problem? How would we take this big question of weight loss and how would we how would we tackle it? And there's lots of ways to go about it, and there's, like many things, multiple solutions. But the first point for us was to say, 
Let's start with the bathroom scale. You see, if you're an app on somebody's fourth page on their phone, nobody's going to pay attention to you. But if somebody is giving you two square feet of prime real estate in their bathroom, take it, right? It's a, it's a really good point. Somebody is going to see it multiple times a day and, and uh, be reminded and so on. OK, so we said, let's start with the scale. That's a Trojan horse into people's lives. And then we said, OK, what do we know about this scale? And we know three things. The first thing we know, it's a really good thing to stand up on a scale every day. It's good to step up on a scale every morning. In the evening, not so much. <laughs> the reason, by the way, is not because we increase our weight during the day. That's not the reason. The reason is if we step on the scale in the morning, this little ceremony, we remind ourselves that we want to be healthy, and then we behave slightly better. We eat a little bit less for, lunch, for breakfast. If we step on it at night before we go to sleep, we go to sleep, we wake up in the morning, it's forgotten. There's no effect on behavior. So it's good to step on a scale every day. It's good to step on it in the morning. The second thing we know is that weight fluctuates a lot. Weight can fluctuate two or three pounds a day. Now imagine somebody doesn't change their weight, but they just fluctuate. Now we mentioned loss aversion. Losses loom larger than gains. In weight, it's the opposite. Imagine a day you gain two pounds. Very, very unhappy day. And then you have a day you lose two pounds. It's a happy day, but it doesn't make up for it. So on average, even if your weight doesn't change, it just fluctuates, the overall experience is negative. Think about it for yourself. How many of you have bathroom scales? How many of you look forward to the experience of stepping on them? <laughs> it's mostly unpleasant news because of loss aversion. The other thing that happened is that we have a theory. We expect changes to happen rapidly. So we think to ourselves, if I went on a diet for the whole day, like the whole day, <laughs> my weight should go down tomorrow. And if I've done it for two days, of course it should happen. The body doesn't work this way. It can take 10 days, it can take two weeks, sometimes it doesn't happen. The, the body is a stochastic delayed machine. And because of that, we get very discouraging feedback. You can have two days of, ex of, two days of diet, and you step on the scale, and your weight went up. You can have a day of Netflix and cheesecake, and you stand, on a, stand up on the scale, and your weight goes down. This is both demotivating and confusing. So if you think about all of those, scales are good, stepping in the morning is good, weight aversion, and uh, the body doesn't react quickly, what would you do? We said, let's design a scale with no display. And we designed it. We said, let's get a scale that when people step on it, we said, congratulations, you've done your job. <laughs> if you step on it in the morning. Now, we do want to give people feedback. But do we give people feedback about their weight? No, the first thing we give them feedback is, you stood up on the scale. That's a good thing. Let's, let's separate the action from the feedback. So we said, let's, let's reward people, give them a good feeling for just stepping on the scale. And then we said, let's give people feedback but not in pounds, let's do it in a five-point scale. You're just the same, you're within one standard deviation, slightly better, slightly worse, much better, much worse. You see, when we think about information, sometimes we think it's about historical accuracy. From my perspective, it's about what information is going to help people make good decisions. So we said, what about the running average of the last three weeks to basically say, is your trend, are you basically the same, slightly better, much better, slightly worse, or much worse? That's about it and we give it with five different colors. This is all the information you need to know to understand the relationship between cause and effect. By the way, if somebody is a woman and she's, and she's on her menstrual cycle, should we tell her that she, she gained weight? <laughs> I don't mean socially, but, <laughs> but should the system say you've gained weight? No, because the system is about the relationship between cause and effect, and if you have a blip, of some water retention, it is just confusing. So we can actually take it out. <clears throat> and then on top of that, if people open the app, we give them all kinds of other suggestions about things that they can do. We recommend reorganizing the fridge, doing all kinds of other things that we, that we know how to do. <clears throat> how does this system work? Here are the results. We did a study with about 1,000 people. These are people in a call center, relatively obese, relatively low income. Uh, and we wanted to approach a, a difficult population. A third of them got the regular scale, that's the control, and they gained a little bit of weight every month. 
Uh, two thirds got our scale, um, and they basically stood up. Uh, the, uh, the first thing they said was that their health was improved. This is just what they said. Uh, lots of them stood up on the scale uh, almost every day, and they lost an average 0.6% of their body weight every month for five months. Now think about this. You look at something really simple, like the bathroom scale. The bathroom scale was designed the way it is because before it was digital, we had to have a display on top of it. But if you take the social science perspective, you can say, what else would I change? To what extent is the scale useful? What are the aspects of it that are incompatible with human decision making? And how do we, and how do we fix it? I'll tell you one last thing. This will be quick. <clears throat> um, medication adherence. We recently created an app with a little turtle. And it's like a Tamaguchi. And the turtle is happy when people exercise, take their medications, and eat well. And the turtle starts being really happy when they do it very well. And the turtle starts being sad when people don't do it as well. And then if they really fail, uh, the turtle goes <laughs> into its shell. And it's an app, and there's a Tamaguchi. And how much do you think, how effective is this turtle? Not very much. But what we also did was we said that this turtle doesn't just tell you how it's feeling. It also deletes apps from your phone. <laughs> we, analyze, we analyze what apps people use the most. And when the turtle is unhappy, Facebook goes away, Twitter goes away. <laughs> things, that people, things that people love. You know, we talk about angry birds. This is an angry, angry turtle. What is, what is the point uh, of, oh, by the way, it really works well, like even if you, <laughs> what is the point in all of this? Um, think, about, think about the physical world. Think about this auditorium. Uh, we have chairs, we have uh, armrests, we have carpets, we have steps, we have lights, we have air conditioning. Now think about all the things we design for the physical world. It's really amazing how much we've designed. Now think in contrast about the mental world. Think about the mental world. How much are we designing the mental world to be compatible with our human ability? Think about what's the equivalent of a chair? What's the equivalent of a chair to help us make better financial decisions, to make us be make better health decisions, and so on? And I think that if we took, took kind of the social science lens into all kinds of things that we've created or we should create, uh, we could actually create a much better system, a system that is more compatible with what capacity we have. And it's true for both our personal lives and our professional lives. And this is, uh, I think, a hopeful, a hopeful view. And thank you very much.